my friends, welcome back to my channel, or hi if you are new, um, if you've been here for any length of time, you'll know that these are not typically the videos I've done or do on my channel, I am a booktube channel, principally, um, but a lot of people have been asking, and I wanted to try out doing some ASMR, because... <laughs> I would read you guys some of my absolute favorite snippets and favorite lines and language from the picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. This is one of my absolute favorite classics. It is absolutely incredible and I thought that I would maybe read some of my favorite parts um, from the book. If you guys like this video and want to see more, um, let me know because Tell me more about Mr. Dorian Gray. How often do you see him? Every day. I couldn't be happy if I didn't see him every day. He is absolutely necessary to me. He's all my art to me now. I sometimes think, Harry, that there are only two eras of any importance in the world's history. The first is the appearance of a new medium for art is the appearance of a new personality for art also. What the invention of oil painting was to the Phoenicians. The face of Antinous was to late Greek sculpture, and the face of Dorian Gray will someday be to me. It is not merely that I paint from him, draw from him, sketch from him. Of course I have done all that. But he is much more to me than a model or a sitter. I won't tell you that I am dissatisfied with what I have done of him, or that his beauty is such that art cannot express it. There is nothing that art cannot express, and I know that the work I have done since I met Dorian Gray is good work, is the best work of my life. But in some curious way, I wonder will you understand me? His personality has suggested to me an entirely new manner in art, an entirely new mode of style. I see things differently. I think of them differently. I can now recreate life in a way that was hidden from me before. A dream of form and days of thought. Who is it who says that? I forget. But it is what Dorian Gray has been to me. The merely visible presence of this lad, for he seems to be a little more than a lad, though he is really over twenty, his merely visible presence. Uh, I wonder, can you realize all that that means? Unconsciously, he defines for me the lines of a fresh school, a school that is to have in it all the passion. harmony of body and soul. How much that is. We and our madness have separated the two and have invented a realism that is vulgar, an ideality that is void. Harry, if you only knew what Dorian Gray is to me. Days in summer, Basil, are apt to like Perhaps you will tire sooner than he will. It is a sad thing to think of, but there is no doubt that genius lasts longer than beauty. 
that accounts for the fact that we all take such pains to overeducate ourselves. In the wild struggle for existence, we want to have something that endures. And so we fill our minds with rubbish and facts in the silly hope of keeping our place. The thoroughly well-informed man, that is the modern ideal. In the mind, the thoroughly well-informed man is a dreadful thing. It is like a brick and brac shop, all monsters and dust, with everything priced above its proper value. I think you will tire first, all the same. Someday, you will look at your friend, and he will seem to you to be a little out of drawing, or you won't like his tone of color, or something. You will bitterly reproach him in your own heart, and seriously think that he has behaved very badly to you. The next time he calls, you will be perfectly cold and indifferent. It will be a great pity, for it will alter you. What you have told me is quite a romance. A romance of art, one might call it. And the worst of having a romance of any kind is that it leaves one so unromantic. I believe that if one man were to live out his life fully and completely, were to give form to every feeling, expression, to every every dream. I believe that the world would gain such a fresh, impulsive joy that we would forget all the maladies of medievalism and return to the Hellenic ideal, to something finer, richer than the Hellenic ideal, it may be. But the bravest man amongst us is afraid of himself. The mutilation of the savage has its tragic survival in the self-denial that mars our lives. We are punished for our refusals. Every impulse that we strive to strangle broods in the mind and poisons us. The body sins once and has done with its sin, for action is a mode of purification. Nothing remains then but the recollection of a pleasure, the luxury of a regret. The only way to get rid of a temptation is to yield to it. Resist it, and your soul grows sick with longing for the things it has forbidden to itself, with desire for what its monstrous laws have made monstrous and unlawful. It has been said that the great events of the world take place in the brain. It is in the brain, and the brain only that the great sins of the world take place also. You, Mr. Gray, you yourself, with your rose-red youth and your rose-white boyhood, you have had passions that have made you afraid, thoughts that have filled you with terror, daydreams and sleeping dreams whose mere memory might stain your cheek with shame. Because you have the most marvelous youth, and youth is the one thing worth having. No, you don't feel it now. Someday, when you are old and wrinkled and ugly, when thought has seared your forehead with its lines and passion branded your lips with its hideous fires, you will feel it. You will feel it terribly. Now, wherever you go, you charm the world. Will it always be so? You have a wonderfully beautiful face, Mr. Gray. Don't frown. You have. And beauty is a form of genius. Is higher, indeed, than genius. As it needs no explanation. It is one of the great facts of the world, like sunlight, or springtime, or the reflection in dark waters of that silver shell we call the moon. It cannot be questioned. It has its divine right to sovereignty. It makes princes of those who have it. People say sometimes that beauty is only superficial. That may be so. But at least it is not so superficial as thought is. To 
To me, beauty is the wonder of wonders. It is only shallow people who do not judge by appearances. The true mystery of the world is the visible, not the invisible. Yes, Mr. Grey, the gods have been good to you, but what the gods give, they quickly take away. You have only a few years in which to live really perfectly and fully. When your youth goes, your beauty will go with it, and then you will suddenly discover that there are no triumphs left for you. Every month as it wanes brings you nearer to something dreadful. Time is jealous of you and wars against your lilies and your roses. You will become sallow and hollow-cheeked and dull-eyed. You will suffer horribly. Uh, realize your youth while you have it. Don't squander the gold of your days, listening to the tedious, trying to improve the helpless failure, giving away your life to the ignorant, the common, and the vulgar. These are the sickly aims, the false ideals of our age. Live. Live the wonderful life that is in you. Let nothing be lost upon you. Be always searching. Be afraid of nothing. A new hedonism. That is what our century wants. You might be its visible symbol. With your personality, there is nothing you could not do. The world belongs to you for a season. The moment I met you, I saw that you were quite unconscious of what you really are, of what you really might be. There was so much in you that charmed me that I felt I must tell you something about yourself. I thought how tragic it would be if you were wasted. For there is such a little time that your youth will last. Such a little time. The common hill flowers wither, but they blossom again. The labyrinth will be as yellow next June as it is now. In a month there will be purple stars on the clematis. And year after year the green night of its leaves will hold its purple stars. But we never get back. The pulse of joy that beats in us at twenty becomes sluggish. Our limbs fail, our senses rot, we degenerate into hideous puppets, haunted by the memory of the passions of which we were too much afraid, and the exquisite temptations that we had not the courage to yield to youth. Youth. There's absolutely nothing in the world but youth. It often happens that the real tragedies of life occur in such an inartistic manner that they hurt us by their crude violence, their absolute incoherence, their absurd want of meaning, their entire lack of style. They affect us just as vulgarity affects us. They give us an impression of sheer brute force, and we revolt against that. Sometimes, however, a tragedy that possesses artistic elements of beauty crosses our lives. If these elements of beauty are real, the whole thing simply appeals to our sense of dramatic effect. Suddenly we find that we are no longer the actors, but the spectators of the play. Or rather, we are both. We watch ourselves, and the mere wonder of the spectacle enthralls us. In the present case, what is it that has really happened? Someone has killed herself for love of you. I wish that I had ever had such an experience. It would have made me in love with love for the rest of my life. The people who have adored me, there have not been very many, but there have been some. They have become stout and tedious, and when I meet them, they go in at once for reminiscences. One should absorb the color but one should never remember its details. Details are always vulgar. Dorian, from the moment I met you, your personality had the most extraordinary influence over me. 
I was dominated soul, brain, and power by you. You became to me the visible incarnation of that unseen ideal, whose memory haunts us artists like an exquisite dream. I worshipped you. I grew jealous of everyone to whom you spoke. I wanted to have you all to myself. I was only happy when I was with you. When you were away from me, you were still present in my heart. Of course, I never let you know anything about this. It would have been impossible. You would not have understood it. I hardly understood it myself. I only knew that I had seen perfection face to face, and that the world had become wonderful, to my eyes too wonderful, perhaps. For in such mad worships, there is peril. The peril of losing than the peril of keeping them. Weeks and weeks went on, and I grew more and more absorbed in you. Then came a new development. I had drawn you as Paris in dainty armor and as Adonis with huntsman's cloak and polished boar spear, crowned with heavy lotus blossoms. You had sat on the brow of Adrian's barge, gazing across the green. You had leant over the still pool of some Greek woodland, and seen the water's silent silver, the marvel of your own face, and it had all been what art should be, unconscious, ideal, and remote. One day, a fatal day I sometimes think, I determined to paint a wonderful portrait of you as you actually are, not in the costume of dead ages, but in your own dress. And in your own time, whether it was the realism of the method, or the mere wonder of your own personality, thus directly presented to me without mist or veil, I cannot tell. But I know that as I worked at it, every flake and film of color seemed to me to reveal my secret. I grew afraid that others would know of my adultery. I felt, Dorian, that I had told too much, that I had put too much of myself into it. Then it was that I resolved never to allow the picture to be exhibited. You were a little annoyed, but then you did not realize all that it meant to me. Harry, to whom I talked about it, laughed at me, but I did not mind that. When the picture was finished and I sat alone with it, I felt that I was right. After a few days, the thing left my studio, and as soon as I had got rid of the intolerable fascination of its presence, it seemed to me that I had been foolish in imagining that I had seen anything in it more than that you were extremely good-looking and that I could paint. Even now, I cannot help feeling that it is a mistake to think that the passion one feels in creation is ever really shown in the work one creates. Art is always more abstract than we fancy. Form and color tell us of form and color, and that is all. It often seems to me that art conceals the artist far more completely than it ever reveals him. And so, when I got this offer from Paris, I determined to make your portrait the principal thing in my exhibition. It never occurred to me that you would refuse. I see now that you are right. The picture cannot be shown. You must not be angry with me, Dorian, for what I have told you. As I said to Harry, And now goodbye, Dorian. You have been the one person in my life who has really influenced my art. Whatever I've done that is good, I owe to you. You don't know what it costs me to tell you all that I've told you. My dear Basil, said Dorian, what have you told me? Simply that you felt that you admired me too much? That is not even a compliment. It was not intended as a compliment. It was a confession. It was a novel, without a plot, and with only one character being, indeed, simply a psychological study of a certain young Parisian who spent his life trying to realize in the 19th century all the passions and modes of thought that belong to every century, except his own, and to sum up, as it were, in himself the various moods through which the world spirit had ever passed loving for their mere artificiality, those renunciations, that men have unwisely called virtue, 
as much as those natural rebellions that wise men still call sin. The style in which it was written was that curious jeweled style, vivid and obscure at once, full of alcohol and of archaisms, of technical expressions and of elaborate paraphrases that characterizes the work of some of the finest artists of the French school of Simonist. There were in it metaphors as monstrous as orchids, and as subtle in color. The life of the senses was described in the terms of mystical philosophy. One hardly knew at times whether one was reading the spiritual ecstasies of some medieval saint, or the morbid confessions of a modern sinner. It was a poisonous book. The heavy odor of incense seemed to cling about its pages and to trouble the brain. The mere cadence of the sentences, the subtle monotony of their music, so full as it was of complex refrains and movements elaborately repeated, produced in the mind of the lad as he passed from chapter to chapter, a form of reverie, a malady of dreaming, that made him unconscious of the falling day and creeping shadows. Cloudless and pierced by one solitary star, a copper-green sky gleamed through the windows. He read on by its wan light till he could read no more. Then, after his valet had reminded him several times of the lateness of the hour, he got up and, going into the next room, placed the book on the little Florentine table that always stood at his bedside and began to dress for dinner. I am so sorry, Harry, he cried, but really it is entirely your fault. That book you sent me so fascinated me that I forgot how the time I didn't say I liked it, Harry. I said it fascinated me. There is a great difference. Often, on returning home from one of those mysterious and prolonged absences that gave rise to such strange conjecture among those who were his friends, or thought that they were so, he himself would creep upstairs to the locked room, open the door, and stand with a mirror in front of the portrait that Basil Hallward had painted of him, looking now with the evil and aging face on the canvas, and now with the fair young face that laughed back at him from the polished glass. The very sharpness of the contrast used to quicken his sense of pleasure. He grew more and more enamored of his own beauty, more and more interested in the corruption of his own soul. He would examine with minute care, and sometimes with a monstrous and terrible delight, the hideous lines that seared the wrinkling forehead or crawled around the heavy sensual mouth, wondering sometimes which were the more horrible, the signs of sin or the signs of age. He would place his white hands beside the coarse, bloated hands of the picture and smile. He mocked the misshapen body and the failing limbs. The worship of the senses has often, and with much justice, been decried, men feeling a natural instinct of terror about passions and sensations that seem stronger than themselves, and that they are conscious of sharing with the less highly organized forms of existence. But it appeared to Dorian Gray that the true nature of the senses had never been understood and that they had remained savage and animal, merely because the world had sought to starve them into submission, or to kill them by pain, instead of aiming at making them elements of a new spirituality, of which a fine instinct for beauty was to be the dominant characteristic. As he looked back upon man moving through history, he was haunted by a feeling of loss, so much had been surrendered into such little purpose. There had been mad, willful rejections, monstrous forms of self-torture and self-denial, whose origin was fear, and whose result was a degradation infinitely more terrible than that fancy degradation from which, in their ignorance, they had sought to escape. Nature, in her wonderful irony, driving out the anchorites of feed with the wild animals of the desert and giving to the hermit the beasts of the field as his companions. Yes, yes, 
there was to be, as Lord Henry had prophesied, a new hedonism that was to recreate life and to save it from that harsh, uncomely puritanism that is having in our own day its curious revival. It was to have its service of the intellect, certainly, yet it was never to accept any theory or system that would involve the sacrifice of any mode of passionate experience. Its aim, indeed, was to be experience itself, and not the fruits of experience, sweet or bitter as they might be, of the asceticism that deadens the senses, as of the vulgar profligacy that dulls them. It was to know nothing. But it was to teach man to concentrate himself upon the moments of a life that is itself but a moment. There are few of us who have not sometimes wakened either after one of those dreamless nights that make us almost enamored of death, or one of those nights of horror and misshapen joy, when through the chambers of the brain sweep phantoms more terrible than reality itself, an instinct with that vivid life that lurks in all grotesques and that lends to gothic art its injuring vitality. This art being, one might fancy, especially the art of those whose minds have been troubled with the malady of reverie. Gradually white fingers creep through the curtains, and they appear to tremble. In black, fantastic shapes, dumb shadows crawl into the corners of the room and crouch there. Outside, there is the stirring of birds among the leaves, or the sound of men going forth to their work, or the sigh and sob of the wind coming down from the hills and wandering round the silent house as though it feared to wake the sleepers, and yet must needs call forth sleep from her purple cave. Veil after veil of thin dusky gauze is lifted, and by degrees the forms and colors of things are restored to them, and we watch the dawn remaking the world in its antique pattern. The wan mirrors get back their mimic life. The flameless tapers stand where we had left them, and beside them lies the half-cut book that we had been studying, or the wired flower that we had worn at the ball, or the letter that we had been afraid to read or that we had read too often. Nothing seems to us changed. Out of the unreal shadows of the night comes back the real life that we had known. We have to resume it where we had left off and there steals over us a terrible sense of the necessity for the continuance of energy in the same wearisome round of stereotyped habits or a wild longing, it may be, that our eyelids might open some morning upon a world that had been refashioned anew in the darkness for our pleasure, a world in which things would have fresh shapes and colors and be changed or have other secrets, a world in which the past would have little or no place, or survive, at any rate, a new conscious form of obligation or regret, the remembrance even of joy having its bitterness, and the memories of pleasure their pain. Okay guys, I think that's all I'm gonna read for right to pick up this beautiful book because it will enrich your whole entire life. Um, it was amazing, so 